So I want to thank Austin Water for allowing me to, to speak today. And um, uh, it was kind of a surprise um, in terms of the topic that they asked me to speak on, but it, it fits uh, me perfect in terms of uh, what I've been doing uh, since 2004 um, in terms of uh, just uh, keeping at it, right? You know, we've been doing these systems, uh, alternative water systems, uh, a lot of rainwater harvesting systems uh, since then. And, uh, and, and so just to be able to come here and impart some of the lessons learned um, and some of the tidbits of these projects over the years. And, uh, and so we started in 2004, and since then, uh, we've installed over seven and a half million gallons of rainwater storage uh, systems in Texas. Um, so we've uh, done a, a good bit number of projects. Uh, we've done a, you know, a lot of residential projects. Uh, we do a lot of potable um, systems out in the hill country. Um, but today, I want to specifically talk about large-scale uh, commercial related. Um, but the lessons learned in terms of potable treatment um, all those type of things of rainwater, you know, definitely do apply and will apply going into the future as we start to take that next step of using rainwater harvesting uh, to supply potable uh, uses within a, a commercial building. So, um, to get started, so this is the uh, kind of a general, you know, water use breakdown in, in a typical commercial building. Now, every commercial building type is going to have a different type of water use, so you can't apply the same percentages, but uh, just as uh, from the California Urban Water Conservation Council, uh, 2001, I'm sure it's probably changed since then, but when we look at this, we really see lots and lots of opportunities for alternative on-site water reuse and in these places. So obviously cooling and heating, um, is there a need for a potable municipal water source for that, no. Um, landscaping, obviously, no. Uh, in the domestics and restrooms, obviously we have hand sinks um, and then water fountains and those things, so that will be a potable use. But urinals and toilet flushing doesn't need to be a potable um, source of water, no. So a huge percentage of a commercial uh, building's water use can be supplied by alternative water. So it's a great opportunity and then it's just trying to make sure that the technology can meet the end needs and uses. So you, you know the list. Um, so today I'm just going to focus on the um, uh, these last four on here. Um, and, and obviously, you know, uh, lake water, well water, you know, at the site, um, if it's available, that's a great uh, resource. Um, and then reclaimed water, obviously, the city of Austin reclaimed water system. Is a great resource, but it's not ubiquitous, right? It's not everywhere, and I know they're expanding it, um, but it is something that when you when you do a project, it may not be available. You know, maybe in ten years it may be available to your location, but not there. So you really can't count on that per se. Um, so we will look at these other sources. So I'm going to bring up some of the issues uh, that I've seen over the years with uh, designing and installing commercial systems. And then throughout my rest of my presentation, as I show off a lot of pictures and a lot of case studies of, of projects we've done, um, I will come back and kind of reiterate some of these some of these issues. Um, but first off, and there's already been a lot of questions about cost of these systems. And so, uh, to start off, one of the biggest things is not budgeting correctly, um, or and not understanding the true cost. And so, um, I've been on plenty of projects, and particularly with rainwater. Because rainwater is a system that can be delineated potentially outside the building, right? You can put a tank outside the building. So then, if it doesn't come in on budget, what do you do? You just get rid of the tank, run the downspouts out as you normally would, and that rainwater <laughs> system goes away. So by not understanding the true cost, um, I've seen a lot of these, uh, these projects uh, get PE'd out, which is a shame. Um, and so being able to understand that and have a knowledgeable source and not uh, browsing the internet and finding the, hey, I read somewhere that a rainwater system costs a dollar a gallon, right? Well, maybe in 1990 when that web page was written and that information was probably, probably dated, right? Uh, but so new information and just really understanding and then the nuts and bolts, right? So when, when this rainwater system goes into the building, 
Uh, what are the costs for the changes in the plumbing, um, additional filters, all those type of things. And so understanding that as a, as a whole cost and not just, hey, well, I got a quote from a rainwater cistern company that said the tank was going to be this amount, and that's what we budgeted. So there's, there's a lot more to the nuts and bolts. No design or over design. So uh, it's gotten better over the years. Again, I started in 2004, so I've seen a lot of projects. Um, I've seen projects where the, the plans are essentially a circle, and it says rainwater harvesting system. <laughs> Nothing else. Um, it doesn't even necessarily have a specification for that actual tank that they're showing in that circle. Um, so it's gone from that um, to obviously the over design. And, and one of the over design examples I always use is a project we did down in Laredo on a uh, recreational center. Um, a three quarter horse pump was specified for the spot of irrigation, right? It was going to collect rainwater simply to irrigate the ground. And uh, the specification from the designer at that point was a very sophisticated skid mounted uh, yada yada bells and whistles system and so a three quarter horse pump not that big right this all-in-one system cost to me before i installed it was fifteen thousand dollars and so when you start thinking about cost these systems and, and the roi these are the little things that start to add up to where you go whoa the, the ROI is 100 years. Well, you know, there's there reasons for that. And so these type of uh, over-design issues come into play uh, during those cases. Um, stormwater management and or water conservation. So it's like oil and water. You know, at this point, they don't necessarily uh, meet uh, together in the middle. Um, I think we mentioned about um, in Austin really trying to change uh, watershed protection um, regulations to help with this. I think these are some of the dialogues that we will have, we will have some of the questions stuff that will come up later, is how can we blend stormwater management uh, with the possibility of holding on to that water a little bit longer so we can actually have the opportunity to use it for conservation purposes. So uh, this is a big topic uh, that I see with uh, larger uh, systems. Uh, system appropriateness and aesthetics. And so I'll bring this up just as a minor point uh, you know, with the architects in here. Um, you know, you want this really slick, nice looking building, obviously, and that is what we strive for. Uh, but there are some times where these things are kind of tacked on, and so you step back and you go, man, that could have been done a lot better, right? And so this is something that I've seen a lot. Uh, building project integration issues. Uh, one uh, big one in that is nowadays we're getting a lot more requests to say, how can we hook into the building automation system and how can we monitor the system. And so trying to figure out those uh, key parts of how it goes from pumps or maybe there is some sort of quality um, sensor that can send back data to the building automation system. So thinking of these things up front, uh, rather than trying to tackle them in uh, later on uh, after the system is designed, all the conduits and whatnot have already been put into concrete walls. Uh, think about that. Uh, component specifications. This is a big one. Um, the knowledge of uh, designing uh, rainwater systems, AC condensate systems, um, is kind of a level here, I guess, right? Um, whereas a lot of the other mechanical systems, you know, sophisticated, lots of design experience, lots of great technology out there. And so I see these uh, components specified that really don't fit that situation. Or, or, or nothing is specified, and it's left up to the installer to come up with something because of uh, lack of specification. Because ultimately, what I say is, you know, when we install a system, that's our system. You know, whenever there's a problem with it, they're going to call the rainwater guys, they're going to call the AC condensate guys, and that's that's us. And so, to come into a system that's just a pipe going to a tank, and that's all it is. Well, there's going to be problems with that, and I'm going to be on the hook of. of long-term maintenance problem. So I want to try to think of that up ahead of time. Now, I do have to say, going forward, um, I have seen a tremendous uh, uh, increase in design knowledge of these systems and how to uh, incorporate it. But just in terms of my journey, you know, since 2004, um, there has been a lot of advancement of that, which is good for alternative water sources. And then not understanding backflow requirements, and I'll get to that in a little bit. <clears throat> So uh, the Austinian Tower, everyone knows, right? Uh, 
So in, in, uh, I was brought into this uh, project, and they were looking at collecting rainwater from the 10th floor amenity deck. And so that is, uh, the building goes up 10 floors, and then the 10th floor, it goes into the residential tower. And so they have about, uh, I forgot how many square feet uh, it was, uh, collecting rainwater, falling on that 10th floor amenity deck, they wanted to route it into rainwater tanks. And so um, we, through the design process, <coughs> figured out that there is a much bigger resource in the AC condensate. Uh, the MVP calculated average humidity a year about 1.2 million gallons of AC condensate, whereas in the typical 30 inch per year rainfall collection from the 10th floor amenity deck was about 300,000 gallons. So huge opportunity. So we switched out to that. Um, you can see some <coughs> pictures here, um, and then the tanks being set. So this is a swimming pool from the 10th floor hanging down into the ninth floor. So there was a space there, it, and it was intended originally for the rainwater tanks. And I'll show you, so here was the original tanks, uh, and the three tanks, and they were specified as welded metal tanks, and that was it, like welded metal. So you think about metal and water, those are ready to go together. Now if it was specified as you know, powder coated and yada yada, all that stuff, that would've been great. But still, the access of later on because well, you have to recoat metal tanks every you know, five, ten years or so. So to get into these metal tanks was going to be a daunting task. So we said, we got to change this. And so that's where then we came up with the uh, uh, poly tanks. Uh, and we had to find the poly tank size that would fit onto the cargo elevator because, again, this was way late in the project. So that's where you, know, the, uh, you can see us all in these tanks. And you see we had a close call right there, uh, getting them through. Uh, they had to knock out a couple of uh, uh, wall studs uh, for us to, to pull these tanks through, uh, but we, we got them in place. And so they decided not to do any sort of backup, automated backup. Uh, they didn't want to have to, uh, at that time, uh, the uh, regulations with the backflow and on a commercial building, you know, do you have to turn off the water meter, you know, for the whole water building to test, all that stuff. So they just said, hey, let's not have a backup, and they just manually seal it. Uh, with water hose if they need it. And um, apparently there's only been a couple times um, over the years that they've had to do that. So, uh, but this uh, waters all of the landscaping on the 10th floor amenity deck. So a really neat uh, project that went from rainwater to condensation. Here's a project in uh, Almost Park, so a little north of San Antonio, a little, a little small town there. Um, so uh, veterinary clinic, he wanted to be lead I believe he wanted to really strive to do something really neat. So, pleasure from 8,000 square feet, uh, both rainwater and AC. <coughs> uh, and then we have these three 3,000 uh, gallon uh, systems. And I point this out because uh, SALS was really involved a lot with this one because uh, they wanted to get feedback on amount of savings. And so they provided uh, water meters. Uh, to meter AC condensate, uh, meter the uh, uh, rainwater going out, and it also meter the any makeup water that comes in and then hook to their SCADA system or somewhat to gather that data. Um, and so there's a system. Uh, an issue with this one, and you don't really see it over here, uh, there's a big con tree. Um, and so they were really relying on a very manual uh, gutter screen. Uh, to uh, keep that debris out, and uh, that has been a challenge. And so there will be times when uh, he was talking about a little tinge of, of brown. So definitely that happens because of tannins. Uh, but this water is also just used for the pets, uh, washing the crates, um, all of that type of stuff. So it's not any sort of uh, in a toilet flushing. So it's not human consumption. Uh, so anyway, so that's that. Now point this out is uh, here's a couple more pictures uh, showing. Pipe and lay out, you know, <coughs> filter, uh, or UV system filters, all that jazz, makeup water. <clears throat> the point this out is because from this, then the uh, city of San Antonio put together this condensate uh, guide. Uh, pretty uh, extensive guide, so I wanted to point out there's a little short link where you can where you can download it. Uh, but it's a great resource, and um, it's. Uh, you know, there's still advances and things are changing in terms of AC condensate systems, but uh, definitely a great, uh, great resource. <coughs> While we're on guidelines and standards, I did want to point out the uh, ARCSA ASPE ANSI standard 63. 
um, that was produced a few years ago. So this is so on ARCSA, the American Rainwater Catchment Systems Association, uh, was working jointly with the other um, organizations to create a standard that could be put out there for designers to help with design. So that we, they could actually, in their specifications, say this is adheres to standard 63. Uh, it has all the design elements uh, that you may need <coughs> yeah, in this, so a great resource there. And this is talking about rainwater catchment. And then in addition, we developed a stormwater harvesting standard, standard 78. So the semantics of that, rainwater off the roof surfaces, stormwater is off of uh, uh, pavement on the surfaces. So definitely two different types of water quality. And so therefore, we decided that uh, separate standards would be applicable. Um, so yeah, again, great resources in order to uh, look at what are the uh, applicable design standards that need to be in place or design uh, components. Uh, Dripping Springs Sycamore Spring School just completed uh, a couple years ago. So you see the aerial um, in these three low alcoves. Uh, you see the rainwater system. Um, and so two of the systems are there for toilet flushing. One is for irrigation. Um, and this one also, and I don't want to keep bringing up the system redesign uh, because I don't want to say that that happens all the time. But uh, I think uh, uh, Jonathan was talking about having someone on the team, the AVP, who has experience right, with in developing these systems into the building is really <clears throat> helpful. And I just wanted to point out, because this was the original design by that MVP, and so I don't know if you can make out what's going on with the rainwater coming from the roof into the cistern. And then all this jazz over here, um, just a lot of stuff going on there. And think about this being a school, um, it's basically, would be like a jungle gym, you know, for, for the kids. And so a lot of issues, liability, um, you know, just the thought of uh, trying, they were trying to design these, these filters in the place and, and doing it all that. So with the general contractor, with the school district, and with the MEP, we were able to go through and, and kind of change up the design. Uh, also to some of their operational mechanics was uh, not uh, right, not uh, kind of flawed in terms of how they wanted to process the rainwater. Uh, so we changed that up uh, to you know this this setup, and uh, there's just a design schematic of the, the new setup. But basically using that uh, sec second tank here is the pump uh, filtration uh, housing, um, and then, so you can see all that happening there. Basically, that incorporates the 500 gallon. Um, this one incorporated a day tank, particularly for the toilet flushing, so uh, rainwater is processed from the rainwater cistern through a sand filter, UV filters into the day tank, and then the day tank has a separate pump system that uh, supplies the, the toilet flushing. Here's a couple of just uh, boots on the ground, and that's, that's I always say that my perspective here is boots on the ground. Uh, you know, since we're a design build uh, company, uh, we, we see a lot of the design issues, but because we're also my guys are out there, guys and gals out there doing the, the work. We're seeing the, the on-site issues. There's inside of one of the, the cisterns. So a lot of stuff going on, um, different things. <coughs> Hayes ISD, uh, Buda Elementary <coughs> School. So this one's a, a, a neat project because of how they showcased uh, the rainwater system out front. So two 50,000 uh, gallon tanks collecting both rainwater and condensate uh, from about 40,000 square feet. Um, this, uh, you know, so I'm showing you some of the pictures of the pump uh, set up, uh, pump and uh, little inlet filter. This is just for irrigation. So again, this is where we come back to matching uh, quality and, and the design of the system to the needs. So you know, if it's a, an irrigation system, you know, do you need a very sophisticated UV disinfection that has a polonium bulb replacement? You know, do these do you need those type of things? So really, kind of. Uh, having those questions up front to figure out what is the most appropriate uh, system. Uh, this one also has a water meter, so the school can track the amount of water uh, that they're saving. Uh, a and Ag headquarters and college station. So this one, uh, I like to use an example of really a neat architectural uh, design. And, uh, and so there was this uh, canopy uh, that went between this building and then in the future there's another building there now and then uh, roof water from those buildings comes onto this canopy butterfly canopy drains into these four uh, 7500 gallon tanks but you can see in terms of installation 
installing these things into these columns was a little daunting task. So you see, basically, when you build these type of things, you build them from the bottom up. And uh, so obviously, I point this out because while this is really neat and looks awesome and functions, <coughs> just the initial cost, right? You know, everyone comes back to ROI and all that, and that's a big discussion we have. But you know, for for real boots on ground, you know, issues, you know, this added to the cost of the system. Now, could they have done a different setup and uh, put the cistern outside of these and, and all that stuff? Yes, maybe it would not be as striking. Oh, uh, these. Overflow, when they fill up, they were flowing to an underground 40,000 gallon uh, cistern. And so then all of the water uh, pulls from here for irrigation use on the home site. Um, and then whenever the water level gets low in the underground, uh, <coughs> the water is let go from all the above ground tanks and then washes into here to be used for irrigation. Um, so again, overall, really is a cool, neat looking project. But again, thinking about how those type of issues adds to it, it's kind of like, do you want Formica countertops or do you want uh, granite, right? Well, you know, you're gonna have to pay a little bit more for granite and that just needs to be taken into account. And, and if the ROI comes back to be 30 years, well, that is because there's some choices along the way that has caused maybe the ROI to pull up. I'm not trying to make say that every one of these systems need to be utilitarian and look very, you know, whatever standard, but it just goes in and plays into this whole discussion. Uh, I want to point out a couple of retrofits uh, because obviously new build and new commercial construction is always cool to work on, uh, but wanted to show the opportunities on, on retrofits. So apartment complex down in Lamarck uh, wanted to get a handle on the amount of water uh, that they were using for irrigation. And so we came in and installed uh, two 30,000 gallon uh, cisterns. And so what we did, basically this is uh, apartment buildings. And so you can see already they have a drainage system to a detention pond. So now they are no water quality, just uh, a pure detention. So they already had this uh, you know, RCP pipe running through the site. There's uh, inlet grates, but you can see they already also, they were piping all of the downspouts already to these inlet grates. <laughs> so it gave us an opportunity to come in and basically cut up that system. And then, and so you see some of the pictures where we were coming in and cutting up the system and rerouting it and uh, capping off pipes, capping off uh, inlets, all that stuff, and then routing all that water to the on-site cisterns. And so it gave a great opportunity. Infrastructure was already in place and we were able to adapt to that. And here's another one, uh, we really elementary school. Um, so they, of course, have a, a a water quality pond, um, and then the sand filter here, there was an effluent pipe that went out from the sand filter out to the local uh, creek, and so we were able to uh, take that opportunity because the water from this whole site is already coming to this detention pond. And so rather than going on site, putting in pipes, and connecting all these downspouts and all that additional infrastructure, we were able to just capture it right here and so we had a big, uh, big basin uh, came in. There's the effluent pipe right there. And we were able to intercept it. So there's a you know, inflow and then there's the overflow pipe to go out. It is a simple submersible uh, system. Um, and then it pumps over to a 100,000 gallon tank. And the great thing about a system like that coming from a sand filter is the water is pretty clean, right? It's already flowing through that sand filter. Obviously, there's you know, maintenance always on sand filters, but as long as that's maintained, so pretty clear water that's coming out uh, of that uh, sand filter. So again, a great uh, opportunity uh, to piggyback on existing infrastructure. Now I want to just real fast run through some of the large system components, um, because you go online and you, you kind of research you know, filters and whatnot, and you'll come across a lot of the smaller residential style. But I kind of want to highlight some of the uh, larger uh, system components that are available. So starting out with inlet filtration, um, I do have to say that you know, all of these are European or Australian companies that manufacture these. Uh, there's not a US uh, uh, manufacturer of these type of systems. Basically, you have a, a, a few different types. So you have a vortex filter, you know, water coming in, uh, shoots around this vortex, um, and the water that uh, uh, shoots out goes to the cistern, and then this is if there's a lot of debris, and obviously that's going to slow down some of the vortexing and allow that to kind of self-clean itself. You have this hydraulic jump filters, water coming in here, the principal hydraulic jump, 
um, is to help clean out uh, debris. But then there's a screen filter here, and then the filtered water to the cistern. Uh, kind of a similar, um, but no hydraulic jump, just water coming over. And then this is water that comes in, rises up, and then these little baffles are screened uh, baffles. So then as that water rises up and cascades over that filter, it goes in through that screen inlet. Uh, and then inside those are chambers and then route that water to the cistern. So again, just to show you that, you know, and, and these can be large. I mean, you're talking 100,000 square foot filtration capacity. So really large capacities available. Um, first flush diversion. So uh, this is one of these topics that uh, is kind of like, oh, that's, that's difficult. So we're not going to do it. And so, uh, but the principle is, and you think about this with stormwater coming off of a parking lot, you know, that first bit of water that comes off the parking lot obviously carries more of the oils and greases than the remaining uh, storm um, water coming off. So first flush is the idea of, of capturing that water separately and not, uh, or, or, or letting go of that water separately and not storing it. So this is a kind of a neat little, little device, real small device, but really powerful. <coughs> and, uh, it, it can do a lot of things, but one of the big things is being able to automatically uh, dose out the first flush. And so they can do that from a uh, intensity reading. So it has an optic uh, rain sensor. And so it can sense when a certain intensity is reached, then it will close the uh, valve to allow the rainwater to get to the cistern. So, uh, and then it has a, a, a drop setting. So then it adds a little bit more time as weeks of non-rain goes by, because obviously you're gonna collect more dust and debris on, on roof surfaces. So a really cool opportunity here. Um, pump and filtration systems, so they can range from, again, constructed pump and filtration, so meaning you know, this type of system, irrigation only, nothing crazy, right? All the way to uh, the skid-mounted pump and filtration systems. Um, so if that uh, project needs something on that scale, then that is available. I'm going to run through pictures real fast of different types of cisterns. So galvanized metal, coated on the inside, twin oats library. Uh, corrugated metal tanks, uh, this is actually a vertical detention system. So what you can't see here is there's a bunch of pipes coming out at different levels um, that will allow uh, stormwater to be uh, dosed out. Um, and so this site was very tight in Fort Worth, and so they didn't have space for a detention pond. So this vertical detention idea, uh, a Pioneer water tank model, um, a, coated, uh, a tank that has a surround basically. Um, so it's a metal tank, corrugated metal with a, a facade. Um, uh, this is an ACC uh, Leander, a San Gabriel uh, campus. So these are actually uh, welded steel metal tanks, uh, power coated. Um, this is a neat system because it's both stormwater and conservation. And so the, the volume is divided up. And so then if a rainstorm comes, doesn't get to that level of the stormwater uh, management uh, amount, then it doesn't trigger it. And so then that water can be available for water, treat, uh, for water conservation for the irrigation use. But if the rainstorm, you know, obviously is a long, intense storm event, then when that water reaches and triggers that, then that uh, upper portion of the volume here, uh, essentially half, it's about half and half, that triggers the stormwater management system, which you know, waits 12 hours and then doses it out over the allotted time for this system. Underground poly tanks, um, underground modular. Uh, so these are like milk crates, if you want to keep it simple like that, but they're constructed on site. Um, so the great thing is that they're flat packed on the site, and so rather than having to crane in a big 30,000 gallon underground fiberglass tank, this was 30,000 gallons of volume. So um, works on some sites. Here's a, a, a rest stop down near Laredo that we did, a, a 15,000 gallon uh, rainwater collection system, uh, underground fiberglass um, tank Xerxes. This is the ACC Highland uh, parking garage project we're working on now. Uh, so there's two of these bays. This is the under basement <coughs> of, the, of the parking garage. Um, and so this together is about 600,000 gallons of storage. Um, and this is actually collecting rainwater from the buildings across the street. Again, this is all ACC, so they can easily do that. But this is uh, uh, collecting from about 100,000 square foot <coughs> buildings on the other side of the street, uh, bringing it over. Not collecting from the, the parking lot because the roof is also a, uh, a structure. I, parking area, so the oil and greases and those things. Backflow requirements, RPZ, backflow prevention device, 
I pointed out the project we did early on. Southwest Elementary, and we installed a 26,000 gallon rainwater cistern. It's gonna have a pump on it to pressurize it for irrigation use. The cross connection, when they're doing their inspection, said, wait a minute, there's no RPZ. And I don't know what it was at that, it was probably a six inch water line. From a, there's no RPZ on the six inch water line. So basically the pump system was scrapped, a hose bin was plugged into the bottom of this 26,000 gallon tank. So it's so a 26,000 gallon rain barrel. I think the facility guys have, have figured out a way to, to use that water, uh, but uh, not understanding and budgeting for these things up front uh, really hurt that project. And so it made it so that it be the pump system and made it into a rain barrel. Uh, gray water system, per now as follows, we did uh, shower water back to toilet flushing. Um, so this is one that we designed and installed ourselves. So uh, collection tank, uh, treatment, sand filter, uh, chlorine, uh, boom, it's a big tank, and then flushing. I'm going fast because I'm over my time. Uh, uh, gray water, aqua loop, a really cool opportunity for a larger scale commercial, uh, particularly in, in buildings where the quality uh, needs to be a certain level. Um, NSF 350 certified, I think one of the only gray water systems out there that's, that's actually certified there. Um, here's some internal pictures. Um, that, that, uh, dual plumb. Think about our buildings, they're going to be around for a long, long time. And so dual plumbing is actually a way to future-proof. I always tell people, you know, dual plumb and then later on maybe you can uh, invest in the system. Obviously, you know, we're working on projects where we want to get it done and then have to think about it. But the idea that when you single plumb something, the idea of retrofitting and all that and the cost incorporated for doing that in the future is just uh, difficult. So dual plumb, if we can. Uh, even if you're not using the water from the get-go. So, yes, thank y'all very much. <laughs>